Now that gives the American capitalist class a major problem. How are you going to handle the decline? It is the disintegration of capitalism that is creating the fertile ground for socialism. And the other thing you might find interesting is that when you ask people in detail why they don't like socialism, they don't have much of a of an argument. And it's not because they're, they're, they're unintelligent or anything like that. No one has ever taught them what is socialism. I was born in the Soviet Union, but have lived in the United States for almost two decades. As such, I've witnessed fierce debates about socialism versus capitalism on both sides of the ocean. One thing that has bothered me tremendously was that neither side could clearly articulate what those terms really mean. That is why for this episode I interviewed Dr. Richard Wolff, the most famous economist specializing in socialism and Marxism. I wanted him to educate me on what socialism is and what it isn't. Dr. Wolf doesn't need an introduction, but if for some reason you don't know him, please check his bio in the description. But before we start, I'd like to ask you for a quick favor. Please subscribe to the channel, share your thoughts in the comment section, and let's continue growing this community together. Why do Americans, and particularly those on the right, are so almost hostile when they hear the word socialism? You have to understand that um, since the end of the Second World War, so roughly 1945, this country has been in a total intellectual, ideological war, there's no better word for it, against everything having to do with socialism, communism, Marxism, anarchy. These were defined in our culture as evil, threatening, dangerous in every way. I was born in the United States. I've lived here all my life. In my elementary school, in my high school, in my college, an endless indoctrination that the United States was the place of democracy and freedom and all of that. And the Soviet Union for a while was altogether evil, but not just the Soviet Union. It didn't matter whether it was Lenin or Stalin or Khrushchev or Yeltsin. It didn't make any difference. There was all awful. And Cuba was awful. And North Korea was awful. And China was awful. It was just awful, awful, awful. And you know, if you grow up in a society that tells you that over and over again, it's not at all surprising that people, even people who don't pay much attention, people who don't care that much, that's all they ever hear, uh, then they're going to have a feeling that this is a very negative sort of thing. And that's what we've had for all this time. I think 99% of the hostility to socialism comes from this endless ideological battle, you know, in which... The other side never had a chance. There, no one, in my experience, no one ever in any classroom I ever attended got up and said to the class, I like socialism. Here's why I like it. So that we could even hear it. We never got it. The fear in this country, the fear, because that's what it really is. The fear about socialism dictated a kind of keep it away. Uh, you know, uh, covering your eyes, covering your ears because of the anxiety uh, that was uh, affected. And this has had two interesting results. Number one, it didn't work. In other words, millions of Americans remained quietly, privately, quite interested in socialism, which you can see because Bernie Sanders got a lot of votes, because AOC, if you follow American politics, socialism has come back remarkably. So it didn't go very deep, this anti-socialism. Uh, it's pretty much at the surface. And the other thing you might find interesting is that when you ask people in detail why they don't like socialism, they don't have much of a of an argument, and it's not because they're, they're, they're unintelligent or anything like that. No one has ever taught them what is socialism? What is the difference between socialism as it's practiced in Germany or Sweden? 
compared to the USSR, compared to Cuba or China. And so the varieties of socialism, they know nothing about it. Most Americans, if they talk about socialism, talk about it as if it were one thing, as if it weren't different. It would be, if you ask me, uh, what's the Christian religion? And I said to you something which was, let's say, Roman Catholic. After a while, you would explain to me, uh, stop, uh, Roman Catholic is one kind of Christian, but it's not the whole thing. There are Protestants and Russian Orthodox and Greek or, and all of that. I have to always explain to people there is no one socialism. There are quite different socialisms. And if you want to talk about them, I'm happy to do so. But you have to stop living in the propaganda universe and begin to talk in a balanced way. Socialism has strengths and weaknesses. Capitalism has strengths and weaknesses. We'll all be better off if we talk about those, compare them. We don't have to agree but the pretense that one is all good and the other one is all bad, that's childish. That That's not a serious discussion. So what is then socialism? Is it political system? Is it economic system? Is it philosophy? What, how, how can we describe it? Well, I think the best way for me to describe it is to give you a short thumbnail history. So socialism is first and foremost about two centuries, a little bit more than two centuries old. So it's long before there was a Soviet Union, and it will continue long after there's a Soviet Union. It's 200, 250 years old. And the best way to describe it that I know how is it's everybody in capitalism who wants to do better than capitalism, who thinks it's possible to have a better society. And in this it, it, you can think of it as people who are critics, who for one reason or another believe that capitalism is not the end of human history any more than feudalism was before, or slavery was before, or village economies were before. Every economic system has always had people who love it and are happy with it, and people who don't like it and are critical. That's human. We're not all the same. We have different attitudes. So socialism begins as a way of thinking about capitalism from the standpoint that the human race can and should do better. It has the same impulse as led slaves to say we can do better than slavery or feudal serfs you know, back in the early 19th century Russia, saying to themselves, we can do better. You can see those in in uh, Chekhov's plays. You can see it in Chernyshevsky's novels, uh, all of that. So in capitalism, there have always been people, I'm one of them, who thinks we can and should do better. All right. Then along comes the first really careful, systematic thinker, Karl Marx, He's a socialist. He thinks we can do better. He lives from 1818 to 1883. And during that time, he writes a socialist critique of capitalism. Marx never wrote about communism or what socialism would be because he thought that was in the future and he couldn't predict the future any better than anybody else could. What he could do is talk about the capitalism that swept across Europe during his lifetime. And so he analyzed that capitalism from the standpoint that we can and should do better. Then, for the first time toward the end of his life, a group of people who agreed with his ideas took power in the city of Paris, France, 1871, the Paris Commune. And for a few weeks, that's all, they were in charge of the city of Paris. They had then the first time to ask the question, if we're socialists and if we have overcome capitalism, what do we do? What does it mean to have a socialist economy? The first people who asked that were the people in France, in Paris, in 1871. But their little experiment only lasted a few, maybe six, seven weeks, if I remember. The next effort was Russia, 1917. 
Lenin, the leader at that time, was a student of Marx and a student of what happened in the Paris Commune. He took what he learned and made a successful revolution in 1917. And then he faced the same problem. What do we do now that we have taken power? Now that the old capitalists are out of power, having lost World War I, lost the revolution, and then lost the civil war in, uh, in Russia. Okay, since that time, socialism as a movement has spread across the world, as has Marxism and Marx's writings. There are socialist and Marxist political parties, newspapers, labor unions, professors, you name it. In every country on, on earth, any movement that spreads that far in that short a historical time is going to encounter different politics, different cultures, different everything in each country. And that's what happened to socialism, which is why socialism is not a singular thing, but a tradition of, of multiple different perspectives. Chinese socialism is quite different from Soviet socialism. And both of them are different from what the Cubans have done and so on. So the, unfortunately, the long answer to your short question is that socialism has evolved as it has spread around the world. And you simply have to struggle with understanding the differences. I'd be glad to go over those with you, but that, that's the only honest way to answer the question, what is socialism? Let's try to do that because okay. when you ask somebody, uh, they would think of your SSR socialism, which which was uh, wasn't really a socialism, right, in a pure form. Let me go through the differences. One kind of socialism goes by the name Scandinavian socialism, or sometimes by the name social democracy, or even sometimes by the name democratic socialism, and you'll find that in Western Europe and in many other parts of the world, but particularly in Western Europe, in places like Scandinavia, Germany, Italy, France, and so on. Here's what that is. Enterprises are overwhelmingly private. The majority of enterprises are owned by private individuals who own and operate the enterprise, producing the goods and services we all live with. In those enterprises, they're all organized the same way. At the top, a very small group of people, the owner of the enterprise, the shareholders, if it's a corporation kind of enterprise. Typical corporation of, a, of an enterprise here in the United States has uh, a board of directors, usually between 10 and 20 people. They are elected by the shareholders under the rule, one share, one vote. So if you have a million shares, you get a million votes. If you have two shares, you get two votes. In other words, there is nothing to do with democracy. Nothing in the way of one person, one vote, not at all. Wealth controls who becomes a member of the board of directors. The wealthier you are, the more shares you can afford to buy, the more votes you get. So this is this board of directors, 10 or 20 people, or an individual family or an individual person, they have all the power in an enterprise. They decide what it will produce, how it will produce, where it will produce, and what is done with the profits that everybody together makes. The mass of people in every enterprise in Scandinavia and Western Europe are workers, they do not make these decisions. They are excluded from the decision what, how, where to produce and what to do with the profits. Their labor helps to produce the profits, but only the people at the top have the power to decide what to do with the output. Marx criticized that as the core of capitalism. Capitalism is a system with a few people at the top and a mass of people who are told what to do. And in that way, Marx was a critic because he said this is quite similar to feudalism when the people at the top were lords and the mass of people were serfs. 
It's quite similar to slavery when a small group of people at the top were masters and the mass of working people were slaves. We're not in slavery anymore. We're not in feudalism. We're in capitalism now, but capitalism shares with feudalism and slavery this particular way of organizing the workplace. Okay, now let's take a, a, a leap to Soviet Union. In the Soviet Union, the vast majority of enterprises, certainly in industry and across Soviet history, more and more in agriculture, were owned and operated by the government, not by private enterprises. Okay, And for many people, that's socialism. They don't like to use the word socialism for Scandinavia, France, Germany, and no, no, no. But the Europeans do that. They call those societies socialist. Why? Because the government exercises enormous regulation and control. It's still a private enterprise, but the government has a lot of power over the private enterprises. Russia, Soviet Russia, is different because there, especially since Stalin, they defined their system as socialism, Soviet socialism, where the government owns and operates most of the enterprises, and certainly the major ones. But from a Marxist perspective, what's most interesting about the Soviet Union is that their enterprises, owned and operated by the government, use the same internal organization. A small group of people at the top, state officials, right, council of ministers, whatever you want to call it, and then a mass of people who were excluded from the decisions made. By, so in Marx's language, this would be state capitalism. Why? Because they haven't changed the internal organization of the workplace. What would an alternative organization be? Just so you have it clear, it would be if you bring democracy inside the enterprise. One person, one vote, everybody. So it has to be a democratic decision, what is to be produced, what technology is to be used, where the production is to happen, and what is to be done with the revenue or the output that everybody, that would be a radically Marxist socialist trend. That did not happen in the Soviet Union. And now we come to China, because China is a uniquely interesting hybrid, a combination Roughly half of China is private enterprises, Chinese and foreign, including American. They run there. They have private enterprises, just like in the United States or Western Europe. The other half of Chinese enterprises are like Soviet Russia. They're owned and operated by the state. In other words, it's a hybrid. It's a mixture. And the Chinese, by the way, call it socialism with Chinese characteristics. Well, the key characteristic making it China is this, neither the Scandinavian, with all industry is private, nor the Soviet, all industry is state. It is a hybrid regulated by a powerful communist party, right? So there are other kinds of socialism, but those are the three different ways of doing it. All of them would be called using the Marxist theory as I understand it, and I've been a teacher teaching it for, for 50 years. By the way, teaching it here in the United States for 50 years, and I've had no problem doing that. I've never been arrested or impeded with in any way. These would be called from Marxist theory different kinds of capitalism because they have not reorganized the workplace, which means they haven't reorganized the work experience for the vast majority of people. They go to work in an enterprise, somebody else runs, controls, and directs. Whether it's a state official or a private person, that's the difference. But for most people on their daily life, that doesn't make much of a difference because they, you know, they're excluded from the power. So in that way, socialism remains on the agenda of the world in every country, because it represents the, the desire, the feeling of the mass of people that you could do better 
than the non-democratic organization of the workplace, whether that be in the United States or in Sweden or in Russia or in China, because that's still the issue, and that issue has not yet been addressed in the world. You know, it's a little bit like noticing, if you do some history, that the different kinds of slavery in the world were really quite different. What they all had in common was masters, a few, slaves, the many, and the desire of the slave to break that system, which they eventually did. Ditto the serfs in feudalism, and from the Marxian perspective, ditto the workers in capitalism. The idea of the workers having say in the, how the company runs, right? I mean, it sounds like theoretically it's, it's a good idea, but then practically, if you have 100,000 employees, are you going to vote on every single small decision that the company uh, makes? Careful here, because you might inadvertently insult people. Workers can understand perfectly well what you just said. We can't make every decision all the time. We'd be meeting all day long and we'd be yes. great. So we have to work out a system mm -hmm. in which these people are responsible for this decision. Those people are responsible. Maybe there's a supervisory board. But in order not to slip back into capitalism, the supervisory board might, for example, have to be elected by everybody once a year. Or you can mandate rotation. Socialists love rotation so that this year you're on the executive, next year you're at the bottom, because that will help you remember that when you're an executive, don't do bad things to the people at the bottom because they're going to be on top of you next year. So there are, there are lots of ways you can make sure that a collective democratic system doesn't become either unwieldy or oppressive. And that's what they would try to do. How successful they would be, who knows? Yeah, I know there is one example that you use in one of the lectures that, uh, is it a Spanish company, Mondragon? Yes, yes. The name of that company is Mondragon Cooperative Corporation. And let mm -hmm. me give you a rough idea because it shows you what can be done. In 1956, that's over half a century ago, the area of northern Spain uh, on the border with France, the Pyrenees mountain range there, very, very poor, very, very backward. So there's a little Catholic priest in a medium-sized city called Mondragon who has a meeting with his Catholic parish, and he says, we're all suffering from unemployment. If we wait for some capitalist to come here to give us jobs, we will all die of old age before that happens. So how about we become our own employers? Or to use another word, we form a working cooperative or a workers cooperative. So the, this Roman Catholic priest, Arismendi was his name, Father Arismendi, together with six workers, starts a co-op. Uh, and they work together. They make all their decisions together. There's no boss and workers, none of that. No board of directors, no shareholders, none of it. Okay, now I'm going to go to the present. So 70, whatever it is, 70 years or more. The Mondragon Cooperative Corporation has become a corporation, including between 150 and 200 co-ops. It is now the seventh largest corporation in all of Spain. It has a total membership larger than 100,000 workers. Here's some of the things they do. Every enterprise is run democratically, collectively. One, per, one worker, one vote. They make their decisions together. Here are some of the things that might strike you. Are there supervisors? Yes. Who elects and hires the supervisors? The workers. Once a year, they get together. If they like the supervisors, they keep them. If they don't like them, they fire them. So notice, it's not the supervisors who hire and fire the workers. It is the opposite. Here's another interesting thing. They have a rule that they've adopted in all their co-ops together. No worker can make more than eight times the amount of money of any other worker. 
So the gap between richest and poorest worker is eight to one. To give you an idea of comparison, a CEO of an American corporation gets roughly, on average, 300 times what an average worker gets. <clears throat> In other words, they have solved the problem of wealth and income inequality by keeping it compressed. Number three, they have rules that, that are rules imposed on the workplace by the workers. For example, in Mondragon, and I visited, I've, I've been through the Mondragon factories. Every two hours, a bell goes off in the factory. And whatever you've been doing for the last two hours, you stop doing. Why? Because they decided it's very deadening to your soul, to your brain, to your being, to do the same thing eight hours a day, every day. You have to be able to change every two hours. It's the only human way to build in developing a variety of your talents, a variety of your skills. I, so rem I remember I was standing in the factory, the bells go off, and I see everybody put down their tools or their machines. They have a five-minute break, and then they do something else, which is scheduled. But, you know, it's just, it's a remarkably different way. And the reason we use the Mondragon Corporation is because it has shown that it is a very effective way to organize a workplace. They went from six workers in 1956 to 120,000 today. That is as good a growth as almost any capitalist corporation. Over that time, they had to compete as worker co-ops with capitalist enterprises, both in Spain and in the wider world. They were able to compete successfully and grow. And then the final thing I just like to mention, they are big enough that they have their own bank, they have their own university, which teaches courses on how to operate a worker co-op, how to finance it, how to grow it. So it's become a whole institution and they have research labs. And you, I thought you might be interested in the names of the two American corporations that pay Mondragon so that their American scientists can work alongside the Mondragon scientists because they do such advanced work. They are the General Motors Corporation and the Microsoft Corporation. Mm -hmm. So you can see the American working class knows almost nothing about this. But the bourgeois capitalists, <laughs> they know all about it. So as I'm listening to this, it sounds great. My my question is more of how much of success of Mondragon was driven by the fact that they are so different by their philosophy from the rest that it, it attracted the right kind of people, like competent people who would be uh, interested working for such company. And would Mondragon be able to compete the same way and attract the same level of talent if every single company in the universe was run the same way? Very good question, but I have to be honest with you. I don't know. We've never had the situation yeah. that you're describing, but you know, I wouldn't be upset by that. If, if we can make progress, and it turns out that a, a, a economic system built on democratized enterprises had its own set of problems, I think that's exactly right. You know, when we got rid of slavery, it was wrong to imagine now everything will be wonderful. No, mm -hmm. we have a lot of problems after slavery is gone. We had a new set of problems with feudalism. We got rid of them. We had a new set of problems with capitalism. I still think it was good to go beyond slavery. It was good to go beyond feudalism. I think it'll be good to go beyond capitalism, but I don't imagine that we won't have interesting questions like the one you just asked that we will, as a human race, we will struggle with. And with Mondragon, who owns the company? Is it also like uh, owned by everyone or it has? Yes. So one other question I had there. So you said workers elect the supervisors. Right. Do you think it also, there is like negativity to that, that they select the most popular person or the nicest person versus the most effective person? or My guess is that, that you're quite right. 
that these elections will be governed by the mm -hmm. same mixed feelings, the same mixed motives that govern all elections. I mean, I can assure you, having worked with many American corporations, mm -hmm. who gets elected to the board of directors not only depends on whatever competence you have, but it depends on what school you went to, what family you're a part of. All of that plays it. And I don't expect that to disappear. I think it will be possible that workers will elect people that are not the best ones for the job because of popularity and all of those. And they will struggle with that problem the way we do uh, in our society. Again, I would argue, I'm not talking about socialism as heaven, the solution to all our problems. That, yes. That's naive. That's as childish as what is good and the other one bad. It's a question of making progress in the world, knowing that there will be other problems and other contradictions that we will have to struggle with. Yeah, I live in here in Silicon Valley, and there is a lot of venture capitalists uh, in the Valley. And I'm thinking, in this scenario of Mondragon, venture capitalists wouldn't be able to invest in the company, right? There is no way for them to make money out of it. Is it fair? No, no, no. That, that's not correct. The, the, let me explain. There are, just like I tell, mentioned to you before, that there are varieties of socialism, there are varieties of worker co-ops. So, for example, there are examples in the world of worker, worker co-ops who accept partnership with a bank, with a venture capitalist, with an equity investor. Some of them borrow from banks, some don't. Some allow investment, some don't. Uh, some make a requirement that you're an investor. Well, you get non-voting shares in the company. You know, there's all kinds of arrangements that have been explored. It's a little bit like capitalism in that way. Yeah. Capitalism, over its development the last three centuries, four centuries, has had to solve practical problems. How do you go from being small to big? Well, along the way, you you allow others to invest. Early capitalists were people who started a business, owned it themselves, usually worked in it themselves. Then over time, as the businesses grew, that stopped and the ownership was dispersed to shareholders and all the rest of it. These are adjustments within the system to cope with its problems. A worker co-op based socialism will have to do the same thing. It'll have to figure out how do we handle it. The reason Mondragon is interesting is because people used to say, okay, a worker co-op could work in a small business, you know, mm -hmm. 10 yeah. people or 20 people or 50 people, but it can never be a big, well, Mondragon shows you, even when you're the only one quite like it, they were able to, they had their problems, but they were able to solve going from small to big. When we think of this type of socialism, right, in the United States, if, is it even possible? Do you think given the this individualistic culture of the United States, historical dislike of socialism, can the country get there? And what would be the step? Would it go top down from the politicians down or from bottom up, from the people who start this type of co-ops? Let me answer your question first in a simple way, and then I'll explain. I have no doubt that socialism not only can come to the United States, but probably will. Mm -hmm. I don't know when, I don't know exactly how, nobody, I mean, I can't predict the future any better than anybody else can. And the reason I'm quite confident is not that socialism is all that wonderful. I mean, I, I think it's better than capitalism. It's got its problems. But the reason the transition will come is because of the internal difficulties of capitalism, and particularly capitalism here in the United States. So in an ironic twist, the best organizer for socialism is capitalism. It is the disintegration of capitalism that is creating the fertile ground for socialism. And let me explain to you what I mean. Much of the world has been governed over, that, over our long history of the human race by dominant powers. And they usually call their area that they dominate their empire. 
So you have the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, the Persian Empire, the you know, fill in the blank. For much of the 18th and 19th century, it was the British Empire, India, Africa, and all over the British. The British Empire finally collapsed in World War I, and it was replaced basically by the American Empire because World War I destroyed the only other possible, which was Germany. So Germany was destroyed, Britain was exhausted, and the United States arose. And for the last century, roughly, we've had the American Empire, the dominance of American military, economic, everybody uses the U.S. dollar around the world. It's, it's all the signs of an empire. That empire is now over. Like every other empire, it rose, it flourished for a while, and then it declined. Britain is now a small, wet island off the coast of Europe. It's got no empire at all. And very hard for the British to deal with this. It is very hard for the Americans now to deal with it. The last four wars, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria were all lost by the United States. Every one of them, the United States entered, tried, and was defeated. 20 years ago, the U.S. dollar was 70% of the reserves held in every other central bank to back that country's currency. Today, it's about 45%. The dollar is not playing the world. As you probably know, Saudi Arabia is now selling oil, not for dollars, which they've been doing for decades, but for Chinese yuan, for Russian rubles, for a variety of other. The role of the dollar, the power of the United States militarily, the power of the American economy, they have to throw trade war against China, tariff war against China, sanctions again. None of them work. You know, in the last quarter, which is the first quarter of 2023, the numbers released last week, the United States economy grew by 1% on an annual basis the first three months of this year. The Chinese economy grew 4.5%. That difference is the same year in and year out for 30 years. That's why China has become the economic powerhouse that it is today. The relative position of the United States tells us that the American empire is over. Now, that gives the American capitalist class a major problem. How are you going to handle the decline? It's a much easier problem when you're rising as they did in the 20th century. Then you're getting bigger and richer and stronger. You solve your problem. Much more difficult when things are going down. How do you manage? And at this point, I have to tell you that my colleagues in the economics profession are spending most of their time denying what I just told you, because it's so frightening, which mm -hmm. I understand. Who wants to face the decline of your system? People have the capacity to not see what they don't want to see. But they'll have to all outgrow that because they're going to have to make more and more difficult decisions. Now, let me conclude this way. When the United States revolted against the British Empire in 1776, we had a violent American revolution. And the British came and put it down. They failed. The United States became independent because it defeated the British in the Independence War. A few years later, in 1812, the British tried again and were defeated again. After that, the British and the Americans made a deal. If you let us do this, said the British, we'll let you do that. And it was a live and let live arrangement. And over the next century, the United States became dominant and the British but they didn't fight. They didn't kill each other. They, the United States is going to have to do that with the next one. Either that's China or a collection of countries like China, India, Brazil, the BRICS, if you know what that stands for. Yeah. They're going to have to do that. They're going to have to face it. You're going to have politicians that have to get up and explain this to the American people who don't want to hear it, don't want to see it. But those are the realities. 
and the future of socialism emerges here. Why? Because as the economy goes down, as the empire goes down, the people at the top are doing everything they can to hold on to their wealth, to hold on to their dominant position. But if you're getting squeezed, if those at the top are able to hold on, it's because those at the bottom are really paying the price of a declining economy and a declining empire. And the American people will not allow it. There comes the socialism. The American people will begin, they're already doing it, fighting against having to pay the price of the decline of an empire that they didn't control, that they don't have power over. That's the patrona, the French would call it, the people at the top. Mm -hmm. And out of these tensions in the United States capitalist system, you will see, you're already seeing a resurgence of interest in socialism. You mentioned that uh, socialism has po positive and negative sides like anything else. Yes. What would be negative sides of uh, socialism? I want to be fair here. They're negative in part because of of the history. You know, nobody starts with a blank slate. The human race has been through slavery. It's been through feudalism. It's been through capitalism. And in all those many, many, many centuries, ways of thinking developed, passed from parent to child, ways of feeling, all of that. And that's not going to go away overnight. Socialism inherits all of that, just like capitalism inherited what mm -hmm. went before. And I think socialism is going to have a hard time dealing with it. Let me give you an example. If everybody's equal in a factory or an office or a store, everybody is equal, have one person, one vote, It implies that for this to be stable, everybody has to put in, let's call it a roughly equal effort, work effort. Mm -hmm. well, what happens if you have a person who, who doesn't want to, who can't, who is psychologically distressed? And only, How do you handle that? That's going to be a problem. Socialism has no ready, clear answer to that question. That's going to be a problem. What about people whose major motivation is to make money? Likely, most socialist systems are, are not going to allow enormous wealth. Nobody can become Elon Musk or Jeffrey Bezos or anything like that. That's not available. Well, will socialism have a problem finding substitute motivations for people? If you don't give people the financial motivation, Well, there are other ones. Will socialism be able to find mechanisms of motivation that generate, let's call it for lack of a better word, entrepreneurship or technical progress? Or, or I think those are things where the socialism, partly because remember, as I gave you the history, socialists are just at the beginning of trying to figure out how to run a society. Russia did it for a while, but Soviet Russia collapsed. So clearly there are lessons there what not to do. Yeah. We don't make those mistakes again. And, you know, China's a little bit different. They, we'll see if they last. We'll see what lessons. But capitalism, you know, didn't come out of feudalism all finished, ready to go. There were many, many experiments in many different parts of the world. Many of them disappeared after a few weeks or a few months or a few years. The Paris Commune lasted seven weeks. The Soviet Union, seven decades. China now, even longer. Okay, they. I think they're learning. But, you know, you have to be open to learn what to do and what not to do. You have to face the failures and mistakes of the Soviet Union, and there were plenty of them, as there are of China, Cuba, all of them. They make some important mistakes. You have to learn from them, just like the early capitalists learned from their mistakes to eventually become the dominant system in the world. I think the socialist countries are doing that. Therefore, I'm, you know, I'm not distressed that the Soviet Union is gone. That was an experiment, one of the first. And I'm not surprised that an early experiment made a lot of terrible mistakes. I just want us to be honest, face them think about them, and make sure that the next efforts to build socialism do not repeat those mistakes.